Hey, welcome to Gracie Schwarzwald. I'm here with my friend and assistant, Erkan Mette, and welcome to our Gracie self-defense course. Um, recently we were talking and you had said, you know what would be a great idea is let's do a jiu-jitsu course centered around self-defense jiu-jitsu. Um, because one of the things we notice is the, the, the comments we get from a lot of people uh, on our videos or to us personally come train with us is the techniques you teach and the mindset you teach, we don't do at my school at all. Um, and, or if we do it, it's once in a while and we never get to train it. And so this, you decided um, this would be a good chance for us to create a course for all those people who don't ever get this kind of training, this kind of um, uh, mindset, and this view of jujitsu at their school. They can come watch the videos and maybe get a different perspective. Um, on jiu-jitsu that's more based on what we call jiu-jitsu versus the world rather than jiu-jitsu versus jiu-jitsu. Uh, this is especially useful for people who come into the art and they're more interested in what happens if I get attacked on my way home rather than how do I win tournaments. Um, so, you know, this is going to be a very long course. We're uh, going to be doing this for quite a while. We're going to try to cover the complete art. So one thing I can ask is go ahead and please subscribe, um, hit the like, hit the um, notification bell, so you'll get uh, notified for every time we post a new video. One thing I want to clarify is that I will never say that the way I teach jiu-jitsu or view jiu-jitsu is the right way and the way another instructor does is the wrong way. Every instructor teaches the way he wants and with the goal uh, that he wants. And that's perfectly fine. But I think it's pretty clear these days that the vast majority of schools teach a jiu-jitsu that's based again on jiu-jitsu versus jiu-jitsu, and specifically jiu-jitsu geared towards competition. So even if you don't compete, it's still a style that is predominantly focused on what would work in a sport jiu-jitsu competition setting. And before we go too much further, because I get people saying this to me, oh, you, you're down on competition, sport, jiu-jitsu. No, I think it is a fantastic style and aspect of the art, but it is a just one aspect of the art. Um, and it should not be your foundational aspect. I have competed quite a bit. I've won Nogi Worlds, I've won Nogi Pans, I've medaled at different IBJJF tournaments, gold medals. So I'm not against it, I'm not afraid of it. But what I see is that it is just one aspect of the art, of a complete art that people are learning as, as the complete art. That's what they think it's, it is, is just all of this. Um, recently, in fact, I had a student, former student of mine, he wrote me just the other day uh, that he had gone to a school in a town he'd moved to and the entire time he was rolling, one of the brown belts was there yelling at him how many points he was behind and what, point, what the score was. This wasn't like tournament training, it was just in a role. And he wrote me thanking me, like, thanks for you know, having that mindset that this isn't about the points, this is about you know, being safe, controlling the other person, actually using techniques that would apply in, um, in an actual fight. And especially since he's a military guy, it's, it was much more applicable for him uh, than you know, counting advantage points. One of the other reasons that we are creating this complete jujitsu uh, course for people is for enjoyment of the art, right? Um, ironically, these days, jujitsu is more developed than it's ever been, right? There are more techniques, people are being very creative, but only in one part of it, the groundwork. Right? It's exploded. There's, there's a ton of creativity, and I think it's fantastic. But ironically, at the expense of all the other parts. Right? They, they, very few schools work takedowns. I can't tell how many people we've had come in here from other schools who have no takedown ability yep. and say, oh, we don't ever do takedowns at my school. Um, certainly no striking or defending strikes. Um, no standing self-defense. Uh, so they're, the one aspect has grown immensely, but the other aspects have all basically gone away. 
And so this is why people think that jiu-jitsu is what? Just ground fighting, and specifically ground sport grappling. Um, so our, cor our course is focused on reintroducing all those aspects that a lot of people may not get at their schools or may never have been introduced to or may not even think is a part of jiu-jitsu, as well as the ground techniques, of course, but m from a more self-defense and fight focus uh, groundwork. So we hope that by introducing you to the complete art and expanding the parameters of what uh, the art is to you, uh, again, not only will you be more prepared to defend yourself, but I think you'll actually enjoy the art more because if you get bored with one aspect, you can go train the other aspect. Um, so I think that's one thing that um, training this way does, I think, is it just really expands your enjoyment uh, of training. You have so many more different ways to look at things and play with maybe the same thing you've done before, but from a different perspective, requiring different applications. Um, the one thing I get when people say, well, you know, I don't really care about self-defense or more, this is one I hear a lot, you know, if Keenan Cornelius got attacked into the street and he doesn't know any of the self-defense techniques or mindset, he could defend himself. Well, absolutely, right? The same would apply for a college football player. Yeah. If he got attacked in the street, 99.9% .9 of the time, he would defend himself fine. That's not the point. The point isn't, can an elite athlete defend themselves? Keenan Cornelius is an elite athlete who spends his entire time in the academy. The idea of self-defense is not be an elite athlete who has the freedom to train all day, whether it's football, um, you know, martial arts, whatever, um, and then you can defend yourself without knowing this, these techniques. Yes, you can, in the same way that if you try to triangle a power lifter, he's probably gonna get out. Yeah. Right? You might catch him once in a while, but the, the idea is he'd probably just power out. Would I, as a coach, then say, well, if that guy can get out, I don't need to teach you triangle defenses because, yeah, that guy can get out. Right? No, I need to teach you very specific triangle defenses um, because you don't have those attributes. In the same way, yeah, maybe a Keenan Cornelius doesn't need to know how to learn specific ways to escape a headlock or deal with somebody trying to punch him because he has the attributes and he has the long amount of physical training that he could get away with not having specific answers to the problem because his attributes and other things will allow him to adapt eventually. The problem is if you have a 55-year-old person who does this as a hobby or sometimes, they have very little leeway to be in the middle of a fight where they have not trained how to deal with specific techniques and then adapt on the fly, right? It would be much better if you say, okay, he grabs you, this is specifically how you get out of this situation. In the same way that when we practice on the ground, I don't teach you to get out of side control by just kind of going nuts Right? I give you exact specific situations. It becomes even more important that you have exact specific answers when it's potentially very damaging or lethal situation on your hand. Far more important than learning how to escape a knee bar because the chance of you ever getting caught in a knee bar in a street fight is almost none. Yep. Right? The chance of somebody trying to punch you, headbutt you, headlock you, pick you up and slam you, extremely common. So that's why we focus on the self-defense training and that's why you should learn it and not just say, well, I'll just become a world champion um, black belt and then I don't have to learn those things. Um, it was really well put to me once by a friend of mine, Jake Whitfield. He said, the goal of jiu-jitsu is not to make the predator a better predator, it's to give the prey the techniques and skills to survive the predator. In every self-defense situation we have three options. Avoid the conflict, escape the conflict, or resolve the conflict. In order of ideal outcomes, it's, it's in that order. If at all possible, I would just like to avoid the entire situation. For this course, we're not going to cover that. It is absolutely important. You should train it. But we're going to cover the more mechanical situations. So we were not able to avoid the conflict. How do we deal with this? Ideally, 
And the first part of this instructional, this course, will be on escaping, right? Um, a lot of martial arts schools and instructors and even BJJ schools, you know, I start pushing you around, what are you supposed to do, right? You're supposed to choke me out, punch me, whatever. Um, that's a resolution, okay? What I mean by resolve is I counterattack, right? Um, it could be I punch you, I do a submission, I pin you. Somehow I'm, I stay involved in the conflict. Escaping is obviously I get out of the conflict. So why do we prioritize escaping rather than trying to resolve the situation fighting back? Okay, it's very simple. Um, something I say all the time is the, the, I can only lose a conflict I'm involved in. The longer I stay involved in the fight, the more chance it can go bad for me. And again, I don't have the ability to say stop, 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 tap, tap. Okay, uh, this is a self-defense situation. He's gonna stop when he wants to. But beyond that, Right, uh, again, martial arts schools, BJJ schools, but traditionally martial arts schools, they teach you to just overwhelm the attacker. And it's because they have a mythology, they're feeding a mythology in your head, right? We all have this mythology in our head and you see the marketing, it's, you know, somebody starts to push you around, grab you, and then you, yeah, you turn into Chuck Norris and you beat them up and you're the hero, okay? Um, and so many schools feed off of that, right? I'm going to teach you the seven secrets that you can defend yourself no matter what somebody does against the biggest guy. And so you're tempted to stay in the conflict. Here's a situation. Um, most of the time, somebody attacking you is what? Bigger, stronger, heavier, more aggressive. Yeah. So you're already finding it a disadvantage, right? And here's the thing. Even if I were to win, I'd knock you out, all of this, I'm even in the right about everything. Um, a police officer friend explained it to me this way. He said, even if you do everything right, you may still find yourself in trouble because you have to go through a series of people who have to view it the exact same way you did. The police officers, the prosecutor, right? A judge, okay? Because there will be, often if there's a violent conflict, there's gonna be legal ramifications. This is something people never think about. They think I'm gonna knock you out, beat you up, okay. smash your head in the pavement, that's it. We all go home. Um, no, very often there's a legal situation. And what that means is there's also gonna be a financial situation potentially, but certainly at least a, a cost of time. Maybe I have to go to court, I have to go to the police station. Um, and these things can all go very, sideways on me very fast. Uh, again, you could have the police officer just doesn't believe what, what you said, or, you know, I beat you up, but your friends are all there, and they say, no, this guy started it. Yeah. Well, now he's telling, and maybe you have a prosecutor who wants to come after you. Um, a quick story to, to explain this. So you had a person on my team. He was an MMA fighter, 135-pounder, small guy, blue belt. Um, and he was out one night with his friends at a bar, and there was a sort of local bar bully who kept messing with him all night. And they were sort of jawing a little bit at each other. The guy was much bigger. Anyway, my friend, my teammate goes to the bathroom. Guy follows him into the bathroom, takes a swing at my friend. He slips under, bam, 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 right? Blasts him, okay? Gets into the fight, cracks his orbital, okay? Ends up going to court. The judge wanted to make a point of this, and also they said, oh, he's an MMA fighter, he's trained, he should have done something else. Uh, he ended up doing, I think it was, it was either seven or eight years in jail. He just recently got out, I think, last year. Okay, all because of this one situation. Okay, again, he was, he was the one attacked, the other guy was bigger, but the system kind of wanted to make a point of him. Um, and they also, you know, overvalued the situation, oh, he should have magically done something else. So the idea of if I could escape that whole situation entirely, it's maybe not sexy and romantic and part of my fantasy, but I would rather go home uh, and maybe not feel as macho inside as I go to eight years of jail where I can feel macho, but I'm eight years in jail. And here's the problem with much self-defense training. We talked about this in our other recent video that people confuse fighting with self-defense, 
right? When people think of self-defense situation, what do they think of? They think of an extremely violent situation that a person has jumped you, they're trying to beat you up, they're trying to rob you, something, and you're fighting back for your life. And those situations absolutely do happen, right? But the problem is, if you only train for that, you have one skill set that only becomes applicable when the situation becomes very violent, okay? Um, so what happens is, he pushes me a little, but I've been taught, rip his eyes out, kick him in the groin. Well, it's not really violent enough for me to do that, and if my coach has told me that, maybe I'll do it, but most likely I'm not going to. And here's the other thing, again, we go back to the legal aspect. You are only allowed a proportionate response. Meaning if he pushes me, I can't bam, bam. Here, okay, that was completely a disproportionate response. I will be in a lot of trouble. But if I've only learned boxing or I've only learned, you know, rip his eyes out and, you know, knee him in the groin, I don't know what to do. There is a timeline, I talk about this all the time, of every attack, whether it's an arm lock, whether it's a self-defense scenario, okay? It starts from low energy to high energy. Jiu-Jitsu is a search for efficiency, right? If you throw a punch and I stop it here, I don't have to use near as much power as when it's right here. The same thing in a, in a conflict situation. If I can stop the conflict earlier on by either escaping or nullifying it or de-escalating it, that is always ideal. But the problem is I need specific tools to do that. Right? And most of the time, people are only giving specific tools that apply when the conflict has gotten very violent. There's a ton of energy, meaning, for instance, from a jiu-jitsu standpoint, if I don't have any standing self-defense, I don't know how to take him down, I only ground grapple at my school, we start on the knees, we slap hands, maybe I've got a great triangle, but what has to happen before? I can't defend myself till we're on the ground, and then I'm throwing up triangles. Okay, and certainly if I've never practiced how to defend punches, I'm eating punches the whole time I'm trying to throw up a triangle. But I literally have no skill set, no ability to defend myself until that late stage situation. And if we're on the ground, you're no longer just kind of pushing me around. That's right. it's, it's, a, it's a violent fight. Okay, so the idea of our self-defense course is to progress from this um, low threat to give you tool sets from low threat to medium threat to high threat. Again, if you only have skill sets at the, at the high threat, you're stuck waiting, right? Which means he can make the thing worse and worse. You know, it might start, he's just pushing me a little, I don't know what to do. Then maybe he's like, hey man, come here. And he's getting a little bit more aggressive. I still don't know what to do, right? Because that's how a lot of fights happen. Let me explain again. You train uh, super aggressive all the time, right? Because that's what you're taught. So like I grab your wrist, like this, right? And even if you don't hit me, you do our escape. Yeah. But, and that's, that's fine, you should learn that. But what happens is, you're at a, you say you're a woman, you're at a club, and a guy goes, hey man, I'll talk to you for a second, sweetie. No, no, don't do anything. But now you don't know what to do, you, or you overreact, you're like, rah, rah. Yeah. Well now, what's he probably gonna do? What the hell's your problem? Maybe he's now a little bit more offended, aggressive, Versus he does something kind of casual. I don't even realize what he's done, that he's done a technique because he didn't go super aggressive. Now, again, if it was much more aggressive, he reacts. I shouldn't say more aggressive, more energy. Mm -hmm. You would react with more energy. But every school is taught to go to 100 miles per hour right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody's going, hey, man, let me talk to you for a second. You, I'm not super aggressive yet, am yeah. I? Versus, you know, I'm pulling you around and then you have to be more aggressive. So when you train, always train different levels of energy. Okay, with all of these techniques, when we learn, you know, how to escape a hold, for instance, sometimes it's gonna be very casual, sometimes it's gonna be more aggressive, but don't always think that every fight is Right off the bat, the person came screaming across the field trying to knock you out or grab you and drag you somewhere. Because if you think that way, you react late. You keep waiting for it to get to that image of what, a, of what an attack looks like. 
And like I said, it's somebody going, hey, come talk to me for a second. You're, you're like, uh, well, that's not really aggressive. That's not like in class. So I, I don't really know what to do. Okay, so that's, you know, that's kind of a realistic look at what self-defense is. Is going to be a timeline. And I'm going to keep coming back to that concept. Okay, so now we're going to go over the course uh, syllabus, if you will, the, the order in which you will get these classes. So with our course syllabus, the first thing we're going to cover is the concepts. Okay, um, for me, that's the most important thing. I find a lot of people, they start jujitsu and they're overwhelmed by techniques. And the thing they tend to say to me is like, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. There's just, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Okay, so the, the point with the concepts in the beginning of our curriculum is to give you a framework in which to fit the techniques that come later. The way I always imagine it is, if you're trying to learn a foreign language and you just memorize a bunch of words, right? You won't be able to speak the language very well. Um, I, there's a, um, a person who uh, has a German language course that I, I listen to, uh, Michelle Thomas, and he has a great saying. He says, with German, you can guess the, the vocabulary, but never guess the structure. Mm, yeah. Okay, jujitsu is the same way, right? You can guess a technique, you can play around with the techniques, but it's important to have a structure in which to place the techniques. So with our concepts, which would be the first number of videos, I'm going to break down the way I view jujitsu and the way I think that would help you simplify uh, the way you think about it to make it much easier to fit the techniques into as we progress. So first we're going to start with standing self-defense. Okay. We're going to go over the standing self-defense with the mindset of just escaping the situation. Um, and then we're going to go into clinches, how to get clinches, how to hold on to the person, how to get to a position of safety. Then we're going to work into takedowns, okay, how to put the person on the ground uh, if you need to, to get into a better control position. Okay. Then we're going to work striking, okay, how to utilize kicks, punches, how to deal with kicks and punches when you're standing. Okay. Then we're going to come back to the standing self-defense once you have those other skill sets and revisit the scan, standing self-defense, but from a resolution standpoint, meaning instead of trying to escape, I'm actually going to counterattack. This, this, we're not always capable of escaping. Physically, it might be impossible, or tactically, it might not be the point. I'm with my family. I need to stay to protect my family. Um, so in this situation, you'll see some of the same problems, but we'll deal with them differently. Instead of escaping, we'll actually resolve into uh, controlling the person or you know, submitting them or doing some sort of damage to them in order to get them to stop trying to hurt us or um, control us. And lastly, after all of that, we will go to the ground and explore groundwork. Um, you will see things that uh, you, of course, have learned if you've trained jujitsu, but maybe from a slightly different perspective uh, which will give you a better understanding of the techniques and how you will have to um, adjust them potentially for different scenarios.